cool. Arcade Junkie. Pretty funny. Uh, okay, so give me a couple seconds here just to make sure everybody's admitted. And, uh, you know, I wish there was a way that people could just come in. But I can't seem to, that waiting room thing, they really want uh, people to check in. There we go, Robert Weeks. Hey. Hello, Robert Weeks. Hello, Robert Weeks. <laughs> hey. Hey, Robert, how are you? Can I hear you? One, two, three, four, you look confused. <laughs> hey, Randy. Yeah, you can record Arcade Junkie, whoever you are. I am recording it, and it will go uh, up on uh, my YouTube channel, just FYI. Uh, what was I going to do? Oh, yeah. Hey, give me one sec. Let me, uh, I need to switch cameras here because this is a super terrible camera. Uh, and uh, stand by, stand by. So I, I, you know, I've been playing with the video thing and I can do this now. <laughs> and I can do other things. I, you know, I'm just kind of messing around with it. So I'm not quite sure how this is going to go anyway. Uh, so hey, uh, yeah, welcome to the workshop. It's uh, we got a couple of more minutes to let people in. So I'm just going to wait just a few minutes here. See how it goes. Anybody have any comments? No. Okay. Be that way. Magdalena, you have been uh, checked in here for like an hour. Where are you? Are you in uh, Europe somewhere or something? Hmm. I don't know how to give permission to record. Uh, let me see if I can figure that out. Stand by. If you can figure it out, tell me. Mm. Mm. Maybe it's under security. Let's see. Uh, no. Mm. Hey, James, how are you? John, nice to see you guys. I, well, I haven't seen you yet, but nice to have you here. Uh, well, well, gosh darn it. I don't see how you give permission to oh they're just joining now sorry uh, hey john hey hey james hello john hello hey hi hey, hello my brothers how are you hey logan you're not actually uh, uh stephen jobs i can see that right now <laughs> i thought you were i thought well he's fucking c calling me from the dead steve jobs is is like trying to be my friend and i thought well what the hell i'll be his friend <laughs> Why not? I mean, I'm not an Apple guy, you know. Well, you know, having having gone to Korea a few times, I'm a Samsung guy. A Samsung, Sam, Samsung. You know, I I I just like their products. They're they're pretty darn good. Pretty darn good. So I'm still trying to figure this out, Arcade Junkie. Whoever you are, what's your real name, Arcade <laughs> Junkie? Because I don't want to call you Arcade Junkie. Uh, Ben. Hey, Ben. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 John or somebody, can you figure out how I give this guy permission to record? You really don't have to, though. I mean, the whole thing is going up on my YouTube channel. So, I mean, that, you know, oh, sorry, old setting. Oh, all right. Well, whatever. Okay. So, uh, Magdalena and uh, Abdul, how are you? Um, are you from someplace exotic? Because you have sort of exotic names. Are you some, from someplace interesting? Like uh, Europe or... Iraq, Iran, Eurasia, you know. No? <clears throat> well, I guess we're not we're not getting any response from them. Maybe they're just listening and 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 so how does it work with Facebook Lives? Because everybody was saying, "Hey Randy, just put it on Facebook Live," which I did. It, it's just that people can tune into Facebook Live, but I really have no idea that they're tuning in. Is that would that be right? Anybody I can't I don't, I don't I'm not sure myself. You're not James. Okay. All right. Uh, were you we able to turn off the waiting room? No, John. Thanks for that advice. I do go to the security thing, yeah. but what, and, and in reading up, what you have to do is in the security setting, type in some sort of a name of the or domain of the person that where they're coming from. 
to admit oh. them automatically. And that's way more work than I'm going to do. Hey, Logan, yeah, how sure. are you? Did you say you were like uh, 16 or 18? Or 16. Something? 16. How old? <laughs> 16. Yeah, I've wow. um, I picked up this hobby in like mm, two, two to three years ago. Wow. So wow. I had I had a friend in middle school that had told me there was a Macintosh computer in the library. I didn't believe him. So during recess, went out and saw there, got me interested that second. I was like, got to find out more. And one thing led to another, Apple II, et cetera. And now we're here. I won't hold it against you that you're an Apple guy. I uh, and, and speaking of Apple II, I mean, it, you know, kind of an interesting story. If you don't like the stories, tune out. Uh, uh, I had a friend that had muscular dystrophy. And uh, this was in San Diego when I was teaching my classes and I had an actual storefront and I, I taught classes there. And, and one day this guy, his name is Larry, he wheeled into my shop and he said, wow, I'm really interested in games and electronics. He had to play with a mouth stick because he didn't have you know, control. And he said, wow, you know, how you doing? And we became friends pr pretty darn fast. And um, his thing was computing. He loved to compute and he, he just loved being, you know, the internet was new at this time. This would have been 90, maybe something like that. Uh, uh, that's 1990 for those of you that are young, 1990. Uh, uh, and um uh, anyway, so we got to be good friends, and his main deal was he liked to compute, not necessarily online because that was you know pretty new, but he loved working on new programs and stuff. But he also liked being outdoors. You know, when you're confined to a wheelchair, you don't want to spend your day in your apartment. So he liked being outdoors. You, you could always see him cru kind of cruising around San Diego, and he's, he's, he's a great guy. Anyway, um, so so we got together on this project apple 2c sorry logan coming back to your apple too he had an apple 2c he had an extra one and i and he decided together that we would make a robot out of this freaking thing so that the robot would follow him around when he or he could control it when he drove around san diego and he could park in a park somewhere and play with his computer because that was his thing so we did it. And it was so fascinating for me to be able to learn, uh, you know, more about computer architecture, but I'm a hardware guy. So, I, you know, I made the hardware interface and, and we took an old wheelchair platform that he had obtained from somewhere where I could interface with the motor speed control and control it. And I built an interface and we mounted his computer on the top of this wheelchair thing making it a robot and we even had a talk back which at the time was pretty amazing we had a talk back and speech recognition because he can't you know he doesn't have hands that work um so the robot responded to his commands stop left right you know forward speed one speed two speed three speed four and uh, it was really cool. Polaroid at the time was making these sonar units available. They probably still are. The same sonar units that they used in their SX90 camera to, to, to determine the distance, you could buy the sonar. And all it did would, would ping and, and, and give you the time back. So, so I mounted these sonar units all around and we had curb feelers so it wouldn't go off a curb. And we had an emergency panic situation where he could give it a command and it would just absolutely stop dead at a, you know, a, sec a half a second notice. Um, and it worked great. And at the time I was working for an amusement company called Nickels and Dimes in Laguna Beach, uh, Laguna Hills, California. And I was the uh, logic repair facility for the West Coast, where people would send everything from, you know, PC boards and monitors to laser disc players to me, and I would fix them in Laguna Hills at, at in the shop behind an arcade, and then send and send them back out. But what I was really doing was sometimes I was spending the night up there, sleeping under my desk, and when I got off work, I was working on Larry's robot, really. Um, uh, and I could drive it all around the, the, the mall. When it was closed at night, I could raise the, the front gate for, for the arcade and drive the thing all around the arcade, and it worked great. Apple 2C, again, Logan, that's the reason I'm telling you the story, if you care. Uh, 
and and it all worked great with me and i had it basically almost perfected it had feedback it had all this stuff and it worked great and i presented it to him and we ended up and I, i was so confident and we ended up with just a major obstacle that we couldn't overcome at the end when you give voice commands, when you or I use a voice command, our voice is the same every time. And if you use Google, you know, it has the voice recognition. You trained it a little bit. Anything does this, you know, and it recognizes your voice really well. But when you have muscular dystrophy, your diaphragm, which is a muscle, is also dystrophic. And he couldn't replicate the same sound with precision. He would say stop or speed one or whatever. But it was different every time. And it was a struggle for him. And so after all that work, it ended up not being something he could actually really use. And then he had to move and we lost contact. So, so that's my Apple IIc story, Logan. <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's 207. Do I have people in? The, oh, sorry, waiting room. Gosh darn it. Hey, you guys, you know what? I should give um, John or James, do you want ultimate power? So that you can do that kind of juicy story. I can do that for you if you want. <laughs> okay, John. I'm I was going to suggest John because I got uh, things going on over here. I might have to jump out a couple of times. So. Uh, okay. But appreciate the offer. Yeah, no problem. Okay, thanks, John. You're the host. I'm, I'm not sure what ultimate power that gives you, but hey, everybody. LF. Well, that's my wife's initials. Lenore. Hey, Brad. Uh, Lincoln. Brad. Hey, Brad. Abdul. Where are you from, brother? <laughs> You never told me. Can you hear me, Abdul? Maybe he's not here. Okay, Randy, I have yeah. something for you. Okay, hey, listen, everybody. Lo- this is Logan, okay? So Logan is full of questions. Magdalena Marcos, you're a male. I, I thought that that was a female name. I'm sorry. <laughs> forgive hey, me, Randy. Hey, forgive me. Hey, nice to see you. Where are you from, Magdalena? Back to you and Log- Logan in a second. Argentina. I'm oh, Argentina. Argentina. Entonces, mucho gusto, señor. Bienvenido. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's great. Hey, Andrew, uh, thanks a lot for coming. Where are you from, Andrew? Um, Ottawa, Canada. Oh, oh, Canada. My home. And Nate, I am Canadian, actually. Are you? Where are you from? Yeah, well, I'm from the United States, but due to a wonderful thing about Canadian immigration and citizenship yes. law, if Eric your Bertini. mother was born in Canada and your grandmother was born in Canada, gosh dang it, you're a Canadian. And so she was born in Sudbury okay. in 1923. And uh, so her mother uh, was also born in, in, I think, Sudbury as well. And, uh, oh. and so, it, it, so I, I reapplied for citizenship. I have my citizenship certificate. I don't have my passport yet. But luckily, because of the results of our election, I don't need a passport, at least not right now. I was not going to bring up politics because it's okay. just too controversial. You know, everybody here, I think, knows how I feel about the winner. And uh, honest to God, I've just had it with those other folks. And I've just had it. And, and I don't give them the time of day. Sorry, if you're, if you're one of them, don't tell me because I'll, I'll just freaking cut you off because I never mind. So let's so hey, let's get down to business. And I'm going to edit out all of this other previous stuff. FYI, because the workshop is just about the technical stuff. And so because nobody actually cares about us. Anyways, it's all about yeah, you. There you go. So so uh, to finish my introduction. So this is Logan and Logan uh, introduced himself to me just kind of recently. And he has nonstop questions, like absolutely nonstop. Uh, And so if you guys don't mind, and I suppose even if you do, let's give him a shot. He's 16. Oh, what the heck? Welcome to the community, brother. And, and, and what's your question? Uh, So after like uh, three or four days of head banging on the wall, I finally figured out what was wrong with that geo seven. I was talking to you about. Um, So after some inspection, I had found out that I put a 10 microfarad 25 volt capacitor at C501. And so it turns out that was not the part it needed. It turns out it already had the modification for the horizontal done. And I threw out that capacitor that I actually needed. So after inspecting, that was the capacitor that was calling that causing that red, blue and green distortion so the tube was not bad so ah, everything was great so i'm glad because that's okay. the only tube i had and only shot for yeah. for for this monitor but mm. so 
thanks to a guy, another guy on Facebook, he helped me realize that that was not the correct part to go in there. So I have that coming on the way. And so hopefully that'll, you know. Where are you buying your capacitors? It. He shipped me one. Um, Where are you buying them from? Uh, Who, from whom? Brad. Uh, a human, Brad. not a, like a company? No, no, no. I think he's a, he's a, he's a personal personal guy. Maybe yeah. just has like a bunch of collect, bunch of pieces in his collection or something like that. Okay, so there's a, you know, this a company that you, everyone, should really know about here in the United States of America anyway, and it's Mauser Electronics, you know, mauser.com. Um, and the nice thing about Mauser Electronics is that they have uh, facilities all across the United States of America. They could ship worldwide, of course, but they are the uh, distributor, a distributor for a brand name of capacitors called Nichicon, which we've oh, mentioned I before. Everybody, I think, knows how I feel about Nichicon. We talked about this in a previous thing. And they are really, really superior capacitors. I mean, in the last class, I mean, the last workshop, I think somebody else also mentioned Panasonic. And uh, I can't argue with that. Panasonic, it was, it was actually known as National Electronics way back when in, in Japan, but Panasonic, they're, they're a great company. And I have no argument with those guys. So I personally buy capacitors from them because they're not really very expensive. Um, and if you're really serious about it, you might, you know, you might want to have a bunch of capacitors. If, if you're just doing a one-off, one machine, great, buy a capacitor. But in general, you know, I buy some of everything. I got everything from one microfarad to, you know, 2,200 microfarads and everything from 16 volts up to, you know, 125, depending on the kind of capacitor it is. And then I have a giant crap load of capacitors, you know? And so, you know, for a few hundred dollar investment, you're not wasting any time, you know, you got the cap right there. But that's, you know, that's just somebody like me or John or James, maybe that are doing a large amount of repair. I don't know, Robert, how many, how many monitors are you working on in, uh, in general? Three all together, I got four, four okay. put in the shed. Okay. But uh, I use a lot of capacitors with the pinball games and I'm working on some other slot machines that i'm going to need them so oh that's right you're multi-dimensional aren't you you do pins and other right. stuff that's right yeah <laughs> that's great so i just did this which is the uh apple one computer and so i just i'm lucky i got a i got, I got a snag on it oh, but these one before the apple two right and holy so holy crap did you get a box for it or just the board no i built the board up from the ground up i mean i got the pcb i went went out and got went to mauser did you no, i went to unicorn electronics they're in pennsylvania and they have so many parts they even have the 4116 rams as well um but which and, we need and, for defense or, hey hey logan let me stop you right there are you saying that this board i'm looking at is not an original apple one board, oh no but a replica board one no i'm gonna cut my limbs off to sell them and then be able to afford one but i can't no okay. i can't afford there's I no was confused. Way. I thought you were holding a hundred sixty thousand dollar board there, or something like that. Well, wow, no. I had no idea somebody would remake such a thing. This retro, you guys and your retro shit are just kind of amazing, <laughs> really. Uh, it's fascinating. If you can't get your hands on an original, why not make a replica? You know. But you, you know, I guess I'm the lucky enough that I was around for the original stuff, so I'm not really interested in a replica. But, right. you know, boy, howdy, you know, props, props to you, you know, as they, as they do in the deaf community, uh, you know, you got, you but got some applause. Reminded me of these capacitors, which are the spray uh, capacitors, and they're super rare to come across. Because they're know. axial lead capacitors, and they just don't make axial lead capacitors too much anymore, if, if right. at all, you know. But again, if right. you go to Mauser, you can do filters when you order capacitors and you can ask for either radial leads, which come out the bottom or axial leads, which come out the sides, and it'll show you what they have. Some of it's new old stock, but with capacitors, it mostly has to be discarded after seven to 10 years, I, I would Just say. Just wasted parts. So yeah. they're, they're worth it to everyone else except the businesses. Yeah. But I get where they're coming from because they have to get rid of stock so they don't overflow. Yeah. Andrew, did you have some comments? I was just going to say, Mouser has a nice feature on their website where you can create a project. So you could create a project for a G07 and, and put in all, all the um, parts you want. And then next time you come back, you could just reorder th through that. 
Yeah, it's great. I have that set up for when I do a class. I have X number of parts. I always order from them before I do a live class where we have lots of hands-on stuff. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and so that's exactly what I do. I open the project. I just click everything, press a button, tell them where to send it. And, and Are and you done. expecting to go back to live classes after uh, COVID? Uh, yeah, if there is an after COVID. I sh uh, there will COVID, be I an after COVID. There will be an oh, after COVID. God, I hope. I'm hoping. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I personally, right now, we, we know that the infections are at their max. So, so COVID fatigue or not, you have to be more careful now than ever. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that we have new administration. I'm happy that Pfizer came up with something, even though it's a minus 100 degree storage issue. They'll figure it out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I'm happy personally because I live in Southern California and our medical system here is extraordinarily good. I did. Ha I did have symptoms at one point that I thought were COVID. I went there, got a test less than 24 hours later. I got the result negative, which was great. Um, but I see other people waiting in line for, you know, hours, an hour, you know, to do the same thing. Sorry, we shouldn't really. Uh, I, Sorry, I don't Sorry. want to waste time in the workshop talking about sorry, this. the important question was you believe that we you will be back to doing uh oh sorry yes yeah. um yeah I, I can hardly wait it's kind of one of the reasons i'm doing this to kind of keep my hand in uh sort of uh you know it's not it's not like an ego thing at all it's just like man if i don't keep doing it i you know, will it will it drift away? And I suppose yeah, I suppose it might. Anyway. You did an on-site one in Toronto, probably close to twenty years ago, yeah. and I was I was this close to signing up and, and driving down to join. But um, you know, at that point in time, young male with young family, it just sure. the numbers weren't there. The numbers are there now, but COVID's in the way. Well, so, what's nice now too, though, is is after COVID, as a now that I am an official Canadian citizen with a citizenship certificate. I can work there without issue uh, before it was sort of under the table. Uh, and, and, and so now I can work there and I can pay taxes and, you know, be a, be a real citizen. So so always cool. for the taxes. Uh, yeah. I'll echo Andrew's uh, point being that I'm only an hour from Toronto, Ontario myself. Oh, okay. Uh, oh. I, I would look oh, forward yeah, to Sorry, this. James Andrews. Uh, Andrew James, James, where sorry. are you? Yeah. Sorry. Where are you? Um, 25 minutes North of Barrie. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, uh, no, if, if you are looking at doing a uh, in-person um, in Toronto anytime soon, I'd definitely be uh, eager to join that as well. Oh, yeah, that would be super. I, I see a question in the chat from Brad. Oh, okay. Speaking of capacitor uh, lifetime, uh, can you get uh, into details on capacitor leakage current symptoms, how big of a concern it is for us? Well, that's a really great question. I'm glad. Leakage, huh? Question. Boy, I hate that. Oh, Canada. Because in, in the Apple IIs, they have those uh, reefer capacitors and they explode. And uh, They have the what capacitors, smoke. did you say, Logan? In the Apple II, the ACDC switching power supply, they have a, what's called, everybody in the Apple II community calls it reefer capacitors. And it's a little yellow, really small rectangular capacitor. And it, it cracks just a hair. Boom. Well, I personally prefer the Metallica power supply over the AC-DC power supply yeah, yeah. a lot. Two really. power supply. Um, sorry, Andrew? So there's your Apple II power supply. Is that? Oh, it sure is. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. It, was, it was within reach. Keep going back to the original. Question. Okay. So, uh, all right. Uh, let me switch. Uh, let me switch videos here. Hang on a second. Stand It'd be on. really funny if we talked about the God time. Sorry. Yeah. Hang on, hang on. Uh, stop that. Stop that. Stop. I'm still kind of feeling this out. Give me a sec here. And start video. Start video. Start video, Randy. Sorry. Hang on. I'm having issues. Stand by. Uh, 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 uh. Please stand by. Your That's call wrong. is important to us. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, you except I'm mental. I, I was just trying OBS Studio to see if this would help me and do other things, but I think it's just confusing. You know, it seems so silly that they can't share a camera. It seems very silly to me that it's not possible to share a camera, but it isn't. So there you go. All right. All right. Uh, okay. Vamanos. I'm wondering what, what monitors that you have there, Robert? In your arcade monitor, in your arcade game. Polo for 
for a. Oh, did you uh, say Polo? Yeah, Polo. It's for a uh, Mortal Kombat three. Interesting. All righty. So, uh, um, Logan, the etiquette at this point is. Let me just do the lecture. If you have some sort of an issue, you can address me. That's fine. Let's not get a bunch of weird stuff going in the background, if that's okay with you. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, uh, so, so here we go. So uh, welcome to uh, CRT workshop number eight. And the question was a bit about capacitors. And maybe the question was a little more than... Um, a little bit more than you need to know. Uh, let's see. So I was kind of unprepared for the for the question. Uh, generally speaking, I would have a capacitor in the class that I would cut open and and we and we'd see what's inside. But let's take a look at the capacitors. And in this case specifically, there is one kind of capacitor we are talking about, and only one, and it's known as the electrolytic capacitor. There are many different types of capacitors, but the main failure item across the entire planet Earth, the thing that fails the most, as you probably know more than any other part, is a, an electrolytic capacitor. In general, electronic components kind of have what's known as an MTBF, a mean time between failure, of hundreds of thousands of hours. Not necessarily LEDs, but other transistors and resistors and things like that. They're expected to last a really, really long time. On the other hand, electrolytic capacitors are virtually guaranteed to fail. Almost without a doubt, given enough time, every electrolytic capacitor will fail in some way. Now, how the heck they make like the Voyager spacecraft that's now zillions of miles away and it's still operating just fine with capacitors, I don't know. I'm guessing that there are capacitors on there. I'm guessing that there are hermetically sealed capacitors. And I'm guessing that a capacitor that would cost us a quarter is $25. I'm guessing, now, it's just my guess. But, but electrolytic capacitors fail all the time. So, so let's take a look at electrolytic capacitors. And, um, you know, John, you're, a, you're the host. Could you quickly do a web search and find an image of a cut open electrolytic capacitor? Do you think, you, would that be something you could handle and show it to us? I don't hear you, John. There you are. I'll take a look. See if you could. I'm just looking. You know how it's the foil and the and the yeah, paper yeah. and stuff like that all tore up, and then show it to us. And if you can't, don't worry about it. Um, so, so um, what makes uh, first of all, what's a capacitor? A capacitor is an energy storage unit. Now, normally, when I do this class, and again, you know, in the workshop, I had no idea what we were going to talk about. Maybe I should do that in the future and kind of sign up some ideas. Anyway. Um, I could take a big capacitor and charge it up with a battery, and then I put a lamp across it, and you can see the capacitor discharge into the light. It glows bright for a second and then dims out, and, you know, that's what a capacitor is. It's, it's an energy storage device. Well, the way a capacitor is built is that any time you put two things that can conduct electricity, two conductors very close to each other but not actually touching, that makes a capacitor. You end up with electrons on one side and ions on the other. And I'm not going to get into that. And anytime you do that, it makes a capacitor. In this case, to increase the capacitance by a whole lot, they have two pieces of metal foil that are known as the plates of the capacitor. There are two pieces of aluminum foil to, oh gosh, Rudy. I'm just thinking, where's my nearest capacitor and how long it would take me to get it? No, I won't. Um, there are two pieces of foil in the capacitor. When you open up a capacitor, if you were to unpeel it open, what you would find is a ribbon like that that's made out of aluminum. And then on top of that ribbon, there's a piece of paper, paper soaked in something known as electrolyte. We'll talk about that in just a second. Hence the name electrolytic capacitor, it's called electrolyte. So there's a piece of foil, a piece of paper, like brown paper, just regular paper, soaked in this chemical known as electrolyte. 
And then on top of that piece of paper, I'll draw it like this, is yet another piece of foil. So it's a sandwich made out of foil, paper, and then another piece of foil on the top. And then the whole thing is rolled up and inserted into that aluminum can. The actual name for this component is aluminum electrolytic capacitor. When you look them up online as a part that you're going to order, they are referred to as aluminum electrolytic capacitors because it's almost entirely made out of aluminum. There are the two aluminum plates, as I just illustrated. The can itself is made out of aluminum. The, almost the only thing that's not aluminum is the rubber plug that's in the bottom. That's a little tiny rubber plug that's supposed to be flush up in it, but when it fails, that's what it looks like. It pushes that rubber plug out. And the tin leads, the leads themselves are made out of tinned, uh, tin. Um, so, but everything else is kind of made out of aluminum. So it's called an aluminum electrolytic capacitor. Now, here's the deal. If you think about this for just a second, and again, normally I kind of demonstrate this. If you think about this for just a second, aluminum conducts electricity. If I have two aluminum plates and I roll them up, what keeps the whole, there you go, that's, that's cool. What keeps the whole thing from shorting out? And John, are you keeping an eye for uh, attendees that want to come in somehow? Just FYI. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, why doesn't it short out if you roll it up? This is important. This is important. Please pay attention. There are two of these plates. There is what we call the positive plate and the negative plate. There's the positive plate and the negative plate. And as you know, on an electrolytic capacitor, just FYI, I'm sure you all know this, on one side of the capacitor, there's like a stripe that is the negative side. The negative lead is the short lead. The positive lead is the longer lead. So this positive lead is just spot welded right to this plate, this aluminum plate. But if we rolled the thing up, it would all short out. So we don't want to do that. So here's the deal. The positive plate, the positive plate is coated with aluminum oxide. So aluminum, as you know, is a very good conductor of electricity, but aluminum oxide is an insulator. So this positive plate is made of aluminum, but it is completely covered with a thin film of this aluminum oxide. Take a capacitor apart sometime. Just get a capacitor and chop it open with a pair of pliers and, and unroll it and take a look at what's inside. And you'll see that the positive plate is thicker than the negative plate. It's like physically stiffer and thicker. And it's covered with this aluminum oxide, which is, by the way, how the voltage rating of the capacitor is determined. Every now and then I get the question, gee, if I replace a capacitor with a higher voltage rating capacitor, would it be better? And the answer is it couldn't hurt, but it really doesn't. There's really nothing that would make that better. The difference between a low voltage capacitor and a high voltage capacitor is the thickness of this aluminum oxide coating that is insulating the positive plate. So then, so, so this thing is, is, is insulated, then that piece of paper that's again, soaked into something called electrolyte, we'll get back to that in a second, uh, is, covers that. And then the negative plate goes on top of it. The negative plate is just a piece of regular aluminum foil, just like the kind of aluminum foil you would use in your kitchen. That's all it is. It's just a piece of aluminum foil, just, just straight aluminum. It is microscopically etched. You don't have to know this, but it is microscopically etched. If you looked at it from the edge, it wouldn't look like that. Microscopically, if you looked at it edge on, it's actually microscopically etched with a whole bunch of lines. And what that does is it gives it extra surface area. If we have these lines on here, there's more surface area. And the more surface area you have, the more capacitance you can pack in a smaller package. You may have noticed when you are replacing capacitors, 
man, there's a capacitor about this big that you're taking out. And the one that you're putting in is like this. And you're thinking, what am I doing wrong there? I'm missing something. There's no way that this could be replaced by this, even though the specs are the same. And that's because of modern technology that, that not so modern anymore, but, but <laughs> enabled them to etch that thing like super cool like that. So we can get more capacitance in kind of a smaller package. Right. Um, Interesting. Now, sorry. Now, the, the other thing is that by having that plate coated with aluminum, let me back up. Sorry. Um, the other thing that determines the capacitance is how close together the plates are. The closer they are together, the way more capacitance you have. So by making the positive plate coated with this insulating aluminum oxide, the, and then there's this paper in between them, the liquid paper, and then the negative plate, they are almost touching each other. They're not touching each other, but they almost are. So they're really close. So the etching and the closeness make for more capacitance. Now, uh, let's talk for a moment about what the electrolyte is. So electrolyte is like, <laughs> Have you ever uh, left bat? I'm sure you have. Have you ever left batteries in something like a flashlight or a radio or something too long, like regular batteries, alkaline batteries, and they leak out and some crapola leaks out? That stuff that leaks out is what's known as electrolyte. The acid that's in your car battery is also electrolyte. And I, I think you know that the, in the human body, there's something going on as electrolyte balance, but we're not going there. Um, so technically speaking, the definition of electrolyte is that it's something known as an ionic solution. An ionic solution. And this may be getting more detailed than you care. Uh, tune out for a second if you don't like it. But, but um, that's what it's really called. Now, what the heck is an ion? Ionic solution. So an ion is simply an unbalanced atom. Normally, if you look at any kind of basic structure of the atom, what we call the standard model of the atom. You know that in the center of the atom, there's something called the nucleus. And then in orbit around the atom, there's one or more of these little subatomic particles known as electrons. This hopefully isn't surprising to any of you. I mean, this is, you know, this is kind of basic physics, right? So normally the way an atom works is that in the nucleus, there are these positive charges known as positively charged particles known as protons, as you know. And it's really the number of protons in the nucleus that determine what the element is. Like one proton is hydrogen and two is helium and three is lithium and 29 is copper and, you know, like that. So, so we have a lot of protons except for hydrogen. We have multiple protons here in the nucleus. Well, in general, in a normal atom, there is one electron in orbit around the thing for every single proton that's in the middle. So let's, let's, for example, look at lithium, which is what this happens to be. Three protons right here is known as the element L-I-T-H-I-U-M, lithium, the lightest of the metals, uh, lithium. Cool metal. If you, ever, if you ever want some fun, play around with lithium or, or go on YouTube and search for lithium explosion or lithium burning. If you take a chunk of lithium and just put it in regular water, it catches fire. It's crazy. It floats on the surface and makes hydrogen and bursts into flame. It's pretty cool. Anyway, so, so remember that there are the, supposed to be the same number of protons in the center as electrons around it. So in this first electron shell, as you may recall, there are a number of shells that make up an atom. There, it can only hold two electrons. There's one more electron in the outer shell right here like that. So again, we have plus three protons in the middle, minus one, minus two, minus three electrons. And of course, plus three minus three equals zero. So that's what we refer to as the net charge of the atom. It's known as the net charge. You don't have to know this really, but that is to say, if I look at this atom as an individual, if I'm just kind of looking at it, it's in my hand, is it positive? No. Is it negative? No. The net charge is zero. There's just as much positive stuff in the, in the nucleus as there is negative stuff in orbit around it. It's 
it's neutral. It's, it's a balance, what we call a balanced atom. But it is entirely possible that this electron can fly right out of its orbit. I'm not going to get into details under, into what causes that. Maybe a future thing. So now that electron is gone. It's just gone. Well, we still have plus three for the three protons in the center, but now we only have minus two electrons, right? We've got this one and this one, but there ain't one there. So now the net charge here is plus one, isn't it? And that's what's known as an ion. To, 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 make, it, to, to, to make it succinct, succinct um, an ion is simply an electrically unbalanced atom. If I have an atom that has fewer electrons than protons, it's an ion. And in fact, because it has a positive charge, plus one, it's really known as a positive ion. Now, it's possible to have other kinds of ions too, other kind of ion. It is possible to also have a negative ion. In an atom such as this, somehow, mysteriously, we don't care how, an electron from outer space or whatever can come in and join that electron. Now it has minus four electrons, doesn't it? Still has plus three for the protons. It's still lithium. Remember, the number of protons determine the, the element. So it's still lithium, but now we have minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four. And so now the net charge, the total charge, the net charge is minus one. And that's what we refer to as a negative ion. So what Electrolyte really is to <laughs> kind of pull it all together. What electrolyte really is, is again, something known as an ionic solution. It's a solution, but it is not electrically balanced. Why does that make a difference? Well, it makes a big difference in conductivity. Most people, a lot of people, I think, most people probably think that water conducts electricity. Do you? I mean, it's very common to, for someone to say, oh yeah, if that's water and electricity don't mix, water conducts electricity like crazy. Well, that's not really true. Actually, pure distilled water is barely conductive at all. It hardly conducts at all. It's bipolar, it, it just doesn't conduct. But if you make that solution slightly ionic, that is, the water slightly ionic, that is, if you add a little salt to it or acid or base or almost anything, it conducts electricity. So the easiest way to think of electrolyte is that it is a liquid wire. Basically, it's a liquid wire. That's the easiest way for us to think about it. It's, it's a little more than that, but it's a liquid wire. Okay, so now wake up, wake up. Even if you didn't understand all that stuff, wake up, wake up, wake up. This will make perfect sense to you. The schematic symbol for a capacitor, or symbols, I guess sh I should say, is this. The basic standard schematic symbol that we use in United States of America, and I guess all of North America and half the world, is this. A schematic symbol is supposed to kind of represent the part, either what the part does or how it's built, kind of. And so what you see here are the two plates. This is the positive plate. And that little plus symbol right there, that is part of the schematic symbol. That's, it, you have to put that on there. So that's the positive plate. And then this other one, the curved one is the negative plate. So this is kind of a- Oh, well, there he is. It actually worked this time. Sorry. Hey, that's me. Coach just calling me back because I missed your- Mute your own damn self, whoever you are. Um, and I'll, I'll my headphones in, so hopefully I'll catch it next time. Um, I'm just gonna be- running an errand, so no big deal. Actually, Someone I guess going to talk because the kids will do it. Thank you. Anyway, so this is a standard symbol you see a lot. But here's another symbol for the exact same part. This is the exact same part. This is a different symbol for it. And I really don't know why. Is this European and this is American? Is this Japanese or something? I really don't know. But, but they won't be mixed up on one schematic. On one schematic, they'll either all be like this or all be like this. But there are a couple of different schematics and the, uh, symbols. And you might even see the schematic symbol drawn like this. Two parallel lines representing the plates, which is they are parallel. They're rolled up, but they're parallel. And then some hash marks in between like this that represent the paper soaked yeah. in this electrolyte. So to me, this symbol actually makes the most sense in terms of representing 
what it is, but you hardly ever see that one. You hardly ever see that one. This is the most common followed by this, any of them. So, so that's the schematic symbol, the two plates. So here's the way it's really built. Wake up, wake up, wake up. And here's the, here's the deal behind capacitor failure. Um, and I'll make this nice and big. So here's the positive plate, schematic wise. Here's the negative plate, schematic wise. And I'll just draw it like this. In between the two is this piece of paper that's soaked in the electrolyte. This piece of paper soaked in the electrolyte is actually touching the negative plate, All right? So here's the deal. <clears throat> Believe it or forget it, this piece of paper soaked in the electrolyte is the actual negative terminal of the capacitor. Electrically speaking, this piece of paper is what we refer to as the cathode. The negative terminal of a capacitor is, is really technically known as the cathode. And, and so this piece of paper, electrically speaking, is the actual cathode. Well, how the heck are you going to solder to a wet piece of paper? Remember, it's soaking wet inside. And, and when you cut open a new capacitor, if you squeeze, you get a pretty big one, and squeeze it, you could squeeze a drop or two of this electrolyte out of it. It's soaking wet. It is touching this metal plate down here. Remember that that's a piece of aluminum foil that is just plain foil. It has no insulation whatsoever. And then the wire itself, as I mentioned before, is spot welded on. The actual component lead itself, the actual tin lead is spot welded. I guess it's bigger than that. Is spot welded, sorry, crimped on, not spot welded, but crimped onto this piece of aluminum foil, which is like really long like that. So you solder then to that leg. And what you're really connecting to is this piece of foil, which is naked, aluminum foil, which is really completely touching super well this piece of paper. And that's the secret to the whole thing. Because wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. As this piece of paper dries out over a period of time, it no longer makes good contact with the actual metal cathode. Mm -hmm. And instead of having a nice, good, low resistance there, which is what we want, low ohms is good. We want low resistance there. Now we have sort of a resistor in between the two, which we do not want. It's known as the capacitors, wake up, it's known as the capacitors ESR. And ESR stands for equivalent series, series resistance. Because what we have here now, which we do not want, this is undesirable, because the paper has dried out. We now have a resistor that is in series with the capacitor. As you recall, as you probably know, there are two different ways you can connect things. You can connect things in series. For example, here are light bulbs connected in series. In, in a series circuit, all of the current that flows through one part, in this case, one light bulb, has to go through the next one and through the next one. So that's known as a series circuit. And in this case, that resistor, which we do not want, is in series with the capacitor. And over a period of time, this, this piece of paper that's in here dries out more and more and more. And one of the things that really accelerates it is heat. In a normal arcade environment where the games are on all the time and it's all shut up, you know, the backs are on and everything, um, for every 10 degrees Celsius rise in temperature, the life expectancy of an electrolytic capacitor is cut in half. So, so it's like temperature is like the thing that really kills, and you know how hot it is inside your games. Um, if you're going to leave the backs on the games and you want to leave them on all the time, I highly suggest you put an exhaust fan in. We did that when I worked for a company called United Artists uh, Theater Amusements. We had games in all the movie theaters uh -huh. in the country. And uh, we decided to go to Granger, W.W. Granger, and buy a bunch of squirrel fans and just cut a big hole, not even a big hole, just cut a hole in the back of the door and, and mount that fan right on there and hook it up to 110 volts somewhere 
and Bob's your uncle. And our failure rate on boards and things like that dropped like a rock. I mean, it compared to like Aladdin's castle, a big arcade chain at the time, our, our board failure rate was like 10% of theirs. And, and, and I attribute that to, uh, my boss, Wesley Clark, who said, cut holes in the back of those games and cool them down. And, you know, cool guy. Anyway, so so here's the deal. You were talking about leakage. The question was capacitor, leakage, and blah, 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 blah. I'm not concerned about leakage. Leakage is this. That is to say, uh, we've got some sort of connection between the capacitor's positive plate and negative plate where the current can go right through. Normally, a capacitor blocks DC. Normally, a capacitor will completely block direct current because once the capacitor, if you apply positive current here, once the capacitor is charged up to the same voltage as that, no, no current can flow that way because there's as much voltage, which is pressure, pushing back the same way it, it's coming in. So, so once charged, a capacitor will block DC. But in this case, because it's not a, it's kind of a combination of um, a capacitor and in this case a resistor. Now we have a nice DC connection through the capacitor, and that's what's called leakage. And in fact, if you get one of the best tools you can possibly get, there's and maybe John, you can get a picture of this. The um, capacitor analyzer. It's called the EDS 88A cap analyzer, A-N-A-Y-L analyzer. It's called the EDS-88A capac capacitor, whoops, sorry, A-N-A-L-Y-C-E-R, uh, analyzer. So I'm guessing it puts an anus in the capacitor, but at the same time, it, it, it also checks the capacitor. That was a joke. So, so if you look for that, so this is a really cool tool because this thing measures what's known as the ESR. And it has some little LEDs up here that most people don't, aren't aware of. But one of the, getting to your leakage question, one of these LEDs on the thing says DCR low. And what that means is direct current resistance. A capacitor should present an infinite resistance to DC. It should, no DC should go through that thing at all. But as it starts to fail, and this e, you have this ESR issue where it's, it actually is a resistor, now we have leakage between positive and negative, and this light will light up, and it'll say DCR low, and maybe you know you have a leakage problem. But that's not your real issue. Your real issue is simply measuring ESR. You know, it's perfectly okay to shotgun the whole monitor. What you guys call replacing cap kits. We always refer to that as shotgunning. To shotgun a circuit is just to say to yourself, well, there's eight parts in that whole circuit. I'm going to just take all eight out and stick eight in. It's got to work. And, and I have no problem with that. I'm a parts changer. I, you know, I just change parts until the problem goes away. That's not a problem. But isn't it more fun to figure out which cap is actually bad? I think it's more fun and interesting as a hobby so, or, or a profession. So, um, so anyway, so, the, so what this capacitor analyzer does is measures the ESR. And when it comes to ESR, here's the thing that you just need to remember. Low is good. Low is good. Whatever the, even if you don't remember what equivalent series resistance is and this whole thing with the, with the, the capacitor and drying out, you just got to know the lower the ESR, the better. And so, you know, typically, you know, yeah, like on a hundred microfarad capacitor, the ESR has got to be really low. It might be like a quarter of a, an ohm. Remember, ESR is resistance. It's measured in ohms. So the cool thing about this particular piece of test equipment, which I, I, I love, is that um, you can use it, you do use it, power off, and you don't have to remove the capacitors from the circuit to test them. You just can connect the probes right across the capacitor you're testing, and it shows you what the ESR is on an LED bar graph. And you know, again, I, I don't have one in front of me. I have one. Um, the darn, you could still get them used, and they're still like $220, which is what they were new. Oh, I goodness. personally wouldn't hesitate to buy that. Or there's another almost identical version made by a company called B&K. 
Uh, just look for ESR meter. There's a whole bunch of them in the world. And I think we discussed, I know we discussed earlier in one of these uh, workshops about the little kit that you can buy for $9 that tests transistors and capacitor ESR and resistors and triacs and MOSFETs and it tests all that kind of stuff. And, and that's a cool thing. If you, if you can't figure it out, email me and I'll, I'll send you a link to that. So that's the, that's the answer. Logan, was that for your question about uh, capacitors? <laughs> no? Did that blow your Process. mind? Okay. <laughs> oh. I got the image. Sorry? I got the image here, Randy, oh, if you want the 88A. Yeah. Could you show it to us? Yeah. Please? That can be on the final, Randy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can review it uh, over and over and over again. There you I go. Don't know. That's the guy right there. Yeah. I love that thing. And I'm, uh, you know, I met the, well, not met him, but I talked to the guy that tested that, invented it quite often. And uh, he's a good guy. And uh, I don't know, it's just a really cool. Just a really cool deal. Well, it is, it is a very interesting tool, but 250 bucks, that's, it's a good process of elimination. However, it'd be cheaper to just replace all the caps at once. It certainly would for you, um, you know, but if you're getting into this hobby, uh, it's expensive and you're interested in monitor repair uh you know that would be my suggestion if you're not then right go to hell i don't i don't care <laughs> no i didn't mean that i'm sorry but I, I get that's why it's important to have esr meters if you're focused on you know just finding that one capacitor failure instead of having to shotgun them all in your right. position right but you know but like i said i really have absolutely nothing against doing a cap kit and we would do it routinely. I would often do it. I mean, if I'm sitting here with a chassis in front of me, a hot soldering iron and the aforementioned crap ton of capacitors that I've already ordered and I have in stock in little boxes, why wouldn't I just throw one in? And certainly if I ever had to remove a capacitor to inspect it or test it, by the time I've got it out, I'm not gonna put the old cap back in. I'm gonna get a new cap and stick it in. It'd be ridiculous to do otherwise. Uh, it right. is my suggestion when you do these things, and I've mentioned it a couple of times, that you do one or two or three capacitors at a time. That is to say, you know, you might goof up somehow. So like, see what your symptom is. Stick a couple <laughs> of capacitors in. Fire it back up. I know it's a hassle, my but you'll get used to how to plug everything in. It's pretty easy to do. And and then uh, and then and then that way, if you do make a mistake, like all of a sudden it's blowing fuses, you know what you did. You just did, and that it's got to be what's wrong. I'm guessing. Uh, Randy, I got a B and K up here. If you want to image, Could you just show, just hold it up to the camera. Yeah, or, or uh, however you have it queued up. There you go. There you go. So you can see it's almost the same thing. It's almost precisely the same thing. It's perfectly fine. It works great. B and K makes really good, good quality technology, like their oscilloscopes and stuff uh, like that. It okay. lasts a long time. Uh, As you know, said, it's it, okay. It's, it's not Tektronics, but it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. So Magdalena, uh, if you don't mind unmuting yourself, all the way from Argentina. <laughs> Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you do and, and, and if you have any questions? Uh, well, um, sorry, but my English is very poor. Oh, so, so there's no uh, suficient. I can, I can see this video tomorrow. Okay. Hey, no, se the, no, no se preocupes. No, don't worry about it. It's fine. It's fine. Okay. Mute yourself then. <laughs> Silencio. <laughs> nice to meet you. Uh, okay. So uh, anybody else? Who, who has a subject they want to cover? Uh, I do have a question about your capacitor um, demonstration. So, uh, what what enables a capacitor to discharge the voltage it charges? Like what? Well, like any battery, if you you have to think of a charged capacitor as a battery. That's all it basically is, as far as you're concerned. So, mm -hmm. if I had a, a charged up battery and I hooked it up to what we call a load, anything using the the charge from the battery is called a load, a radio or a phone or something. The current flows from the source to the load. I, I, I'm not. I guess I don't understand your question, or maybe well, you didn't understand. My father, it that, is. that was fine. Yeah, my okay. father equated uh, capacitors to the tank on the back of the toilet. So the water flows in at a certain rate and it flows out. If the water flowing in is higher, then it'll fill up to, it, to its capacity. But if you suddenly need to pull more water out the back end when you flush, then it has the ability to dump that water quickly when you need it. 
I, okay. I suppose that's that's a good enough analogy. It's, it's just a different analogy. That's all. Yeah. Here's here's another one, real quick. Let me just let me just do something real quick here. Hang on. Stand by. Stand by. Stand by. Stand by. Stand by. Stand by. Disclaimer: That's coming from a software guy, not from a hardware guy. Here's a similar analogy to the toilet analogy. I mean, the uh, very often in power supplies and in, in UK and other parts of the world, the main, what we call the primary filter capacitor is referred to as the reservoir capacitor and legitimately so. So imagine that this is a water tank and here's the outlet. Here's the pipe where the water comes out, right? Mm -hmm. So we can dump water in at sort of any rate and this thing starts to kind of fill up even though i'm dumping this thing in one bucket at a time let's say i you know i walk somewhere fill up the bucket come here dump it in fill it up dump it in like that the water coming out here is more or less constant isn't it um the only difference is that when i dump this in instantly and the water level rises the pressure here goes up a little tiny bit, doesn't it? So electronically speaking, we have the same issue and it's no, we'll talk about it some other time. It's known as power supply ripple. The power supply ripple is the same as this. When we dump water in one bucket at a time, one bucket, one bucket, one bucket, the pressure right here reflects that. And you can see the pressure go up and down like that. So it's called ripple. It's not a desirable thing, it's undesirable, but, but that's kind of similar to your toilet analogy sort of. Kind of sort of. Mm -hmm. That that doesn't that's not happening to tie to decoupling capacitors, is it? Uh, repeat that question. Sorry. That that ripple you're talking about. That does that tie to decoupling capacitors, or is that just only no, for keeping? No, no. Decoupling okay. capacitors are uh, for anybody that's interested. As um, uh, stand by. One sec. I'm having trouble multitasking here. Hang on. I think they're supposed to just keep the power from spiking, you know, keep no, it maintained. No, no, don't, no, don't make assumptions here. Hang on a second. Just, just, okay. Let me get, let me get to it. Um, uh, with TTL, especially TTL transistor, transistor logic, especially um, the output when it, when it transits from high to low or low to high, it momentarily creates a little tiny voltage spike. Well, it's not even really that tiny. It creates a spike, and this spike can travel on the, the five volt power bus. It'll go everywhere. And so, on, especially on these old boards, you see them all over the place, these tiny little 0.1 microfarad capacitors. They're just all over. And in some cases, they're little glass capacitors. They look like diodes, which, and those guys short circuit. So, they're right across that, and they only remove super high frequencies. That's all they do, is they just remove high frequencies. They decouple that high frequency spike generated by a switching integrated circuit from the rest of the power bus so that spike mm -hmm. doesn't travel all over. But you can hear that actually, when you turn on a game and you're not playing in any track mode and you listen to the speaker, you hear stuff, don't you? You hear it making all kinds of noise. And one of the cool things for troubleshooting, it's really fun to do actually, is to make an audio probe or a video probe. I don't know if you know what those are, but you could take like a wire and a in a resistor and just hook it up to the input of an audio amplifier. And when you touch the nodes of a, of a board, you hear sounds. And if you, especially if you have a good board and a bad board, you touch the good board and it sounds like X and you touch the bad board, it sounds exactly the same. That's probably working. Uh, you know, um, that kind of thing. And there's another thing called a video probe, which we can talk about later on where you couple the actual video output. I'm sorry, you couple the output of a chip right to the video input of your monitor and you can see what the chip is doing it's a lot of fun it makes it makes uh makes it easy but that's that's what the decoupling capacitors are for that it has nothing mm -hmm. to do with electrolytics whatsoever no. right okay that's okay. very interesting next, next logan put yourself on mute for just a sec anybody else got something going on yeah, i need some help with robert yeah volume please speak louder well you hear me now yeah i can yeah thanks robert speaking up um, I'm hooking back up this uh, this chassis. I've got it set up so I can do the testing like we talked about. Um, 
But when I'm hooking it up, wait. Uh, can, sorry, can I stop you for one sec, Robert? Can you remind all of us what the chassis is and what the symptom is? What the monitor is, and what the symptom is? Okay, so it's the the classic ticking. I guess uh, you call it the high voltage uh, uh, over protection circuit. So I got no, nothing on the monitor. I can't see any net glow. Um, we check the. Um, you don't like the being called the hot, but yeah, or the lot of transistor, right? We checked that it was good and then i was going to check the power supply with um the with an incandescent bulb yeah right the dummy load right Right. so i got to get that set up and okay. i don't have a um a uh, isolating transformer but the machine has one so i said you know what i'm going to set it back up here these panda checks you can see it's kind of a pain to put it in and out i see so, setting it up here so i could do my testing and that's great you know for the other thing but when i put it back in i forgot where this green connector goes there's there's two of them the first one i don't know if you can see this isn't that the degaussing coil what that let me try to make your let me take, try to make your image bigger here if i can figure out how to do that let's see let me see if i can bring it closer oh, wow. yeah, no. how do i think i think maybe i made it larger possibly yeah. it's somewhat larger huh. how's that <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, that's groovy. Okay. I'll bring it right to you. Yeah. Okay. So I have the, the connection inside. Yeah. So if you look, where are those? It's a two wire connector. Is that not connected to the degaussing coil? Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, I'm not sure what it is connected. Follow I'm, the end of that uh, wire. Just pull on it. It, it doesn't it connect to a, a, a ring that goes around the whole oh, CRT. This right here. Yeah, it goes up into the. Oh uh, no, that's isn't that AC power? Wait, is that brown and and blue? No, this is green. Oh, the connectors. So there's if this. Oh no no no! Sorry, not the connector, the wire, Robert. Robert, what are the wires? Are those green? I mean, uh, blue and brown. There's um, blue, brown. Looks like. Uh, yeah, that's your degaussing coil. That that plugs into a connector called the degaussing coil. There can't be more than one connector for that. So that's just FYI, brown and and blue are standard AC power colors for the rest of the world except North America, basically. All of Europe and such like that. The brown is hot and the blue is neutral. So I got that AC connector over here, but on the board up here, there's two identical connectors. And I noticed that the first one closest to me it has more wear on it so i think that's where i got it but i forgot to you know really document where it goes well i can't really recall essentially but i think that oh. monitor does it not have two yoke connectors and one inverts the picture and you just depending on which one you plug it in so certainly that's something to look at if you see one right. that has wear on the pins that's clearly the one where it goes well, and when if the other connector is all oxidized and dirty then it doesn't yeah. go there well, I just want to make sure what it was before I yeah. plugged it in. What, what I did was we talked about checking the power supply out, and I'm going to do that. Yes. The incandescent bulb, but yes. I, want to, I want to step it like real slow. So what I did was I checked out the bottom of the board. A lot of crack on the flyback. There was more than one crack uh, oh, great. solder joint. So I just reflowed them, and now I'm going to put it back in and go with that. The other, the other connection, um, there's a, a black slider and it does go to the gauges. It's, it's, it's the um, brown. And I stuck it on the neck board. No, I, the Gaussian coil doesn't connect to the neck board. No, 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 no. The Gaussian coil runs off 120 volts AC. So that's definitely down on the chassis somewhere, probably pretty close to where the AC input comes in. The ground You'll board. probably see something called the thermistor. It's probably a little square box, it might be black. Um, near where the AC power comes in, that's where it connects. I, I honestly am not looking at a polo schematic or a layout. If somebody else wants so, to look at that, great. Uh, this is a ground wire from the degaussing. No, no. The, okay. There's a ground that is the CRT ground that surrounds the CRT that goes to the neck board. It's nothing to do with degaussing. It's the oh. spring or the cable that touches the CRT. That's so There's one here. It's uh, J... Doesn't help me to say that. Line. It's J one eleven. Yeah, I don't. Excuse me, one seventeen, and it's a it's a slide on pin as well. So this would be coming from 
Yeah, it's uh, the ground on the- That's the uh, ground from the CRT, right? That goes to the uh, neck board and there should be a pin marked E for earth maybe? Because what we call ground, they call earth. In okay. Italy. I've been to the factory where they made that monitor in Italy. Fantastic. What a fantastic place to visit. Oh my God, it was so great. I really- So the grounding, the grounding wire does go to the neck board then? Yes. Sir. Okay. Yeah. So I had that right. But so it was just another slider here. I didn't know if it went there. You mean by co connector is what you mean by slider? Is that what? Well, yeah, it's, it's okay. slide on and off instead of Okay, the, yeah, connector. Uh, what, what do you call it? the flat ones? It's a blade. It's just a connector. It's the, 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 the pins that are on this, the chassis itself, are, that's known as the header. Mm -hmm. And the connector is the, the other end is the connector. Right. It's also sometimes referred to as a pin housing or a socket yeah. housing, but in this case, connector, I think is. is and I, I picked up a Evil Knievel pinball machine this last uh, week before last, and I've been cutting Ooh. and pinning like crazy. That came out in like 77 or something, didn't it? Yeah, that's correct. That's the exact year. Yeah. Uh, wow. Third day was a day off, so I, I spent all day in my workroom soldering on a, uh, on a board, and really, it's really starting to really go good. Yeah. Okay, cool, Robert. Let me let me just interrupt you because I want to keep this on track a little bit. Um, uh, so, I mean, because we I don't think we have pinheads here. Regotas um, mas? Uh, more questions? I have one if there's time. I was going to say I think there's also some questions from Brad in the the, the group chat. Oh there. yes, I saw that. Let me let me reopen that. Yeah. Sorry, Andrew. No, that's okay. I'm happy to wait. Okay. Uh, 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 benefit of LC103 if leakage direct is directly related to ESR. Brad, um, I could have, that's a great question. That is a really excellent question. And I, I might be a little long, wrong about that because leakage might be breakdown of the insulation. Yes, now that I think about it more clearly. Leakage is a breakdown of the insulation on the positive plate. Remember, that's the one that's insulated. Uh, where ESR is an increase in the resistance in between the two. So um, I, I, I personally can't imagine how you could have a leaky capacitor that would have completely normal ESR that wouldn't be found by the, remember I said the DCR low light that's on the, that's on the, the device itself. It checks for that and it says DCR low, which it would be because instead of being infinite D, DC resistance, it, it would have leakage. And you would also know it's bad. That's another one of the reasons why I like that thing. The LC-103 works, and it's a great piece of $1,500 equipment. But you have to punch in the microfarads and the voltage, and it's just more. And I think you have to remove the, the part from circuit to test it. And as I mentioned earlier, if I removed a part from circuit, a, a capacitor, I'm not sticking the old cap back in. That's ridiculous. I mean, unless it's a $5 cap and it's really a good, obviously very good. Any other cap, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm just gonna replace. So LC103, great thing, but for 220 bucks, I would have that. So Brad, yes, it is a Mirio connector. I thought so. Yeah, I thought so. So what that connector does is, if you move the yoke connector, this is for you, Robert. If you move the yoke from one to the other, it flips the picture. It, it flips it vertically, but of course that makes it into mirror writing. And if you're seeing it in a mirror, that's great, but it also flips it horizontally like that. So, so you see a, a proper picture, but just inverted. And that's something you can always do on your own monitors, by the way. If you ever have to modify a monitor, all you have to do is reverse the two verticals and reverse the two horizontals, being careful that you never connect the two together, right? So the horizontal is like blue red color. The vertical is typically yellow green, or it might be yellow brown in some cases. One of them has high resistance, the vertical yoke, coil in the yoke. One of them has low resistance, the horizontal coil in the yoke. It's, and what I do often do is I simply chop the yoke connector in half and just reverse the two halves. And that, that does it. So there's no soldering involved or anything like that. Um, what's the, the guy that was attending your workshops, uh, Paul? Paul, yeah, Paul where's Sa Paul? I don't know where Paul Jury. Yeah, I don't know. I, where I forgot, but I remember his face and there's a YouTube <laughs> video where he was working with a friend and they had that exact same thing and they did a tube swap and the yoke had in the upside down and inverted picture and they were 
working on swapping the yoke pins to get right. it in the proper. Yeah, you would never rotate or... the yoke. Don't touch the yoke itself. It's okay right. to ch- change the connections, but do not move the freaking yoke. You're just asking for a world of hurt. Uh, we talked about this previously. The purity and convergence procedure uh, is not an easy one. It just isn't. And I admit to being not terribly successful at it to the point where I just don't want to do it. I really, I just don't want to do it. I, I just don't. It's just not fun. For me, fun with electronics is finding a bad part, replacing that part or parts, and having the thing work. That's fun for me. Mm. Whatever. Uh, more questions? Preguntas? Questions? More questions? So just to clarify on this, uh, what we were just talking about, switching them. So yeah. that's basically like, say, for a cocktail table type of thing. Right. You want to switch the image or the mirror cabinets yeah and in fact uh you guys probably don't remember but way back when there was a company like a video game company called ram tech r-a-m-t-e-k and they made a game called clean sweep which was a paddle game and had a paddle on the bottom and you were just trying to take out a field of dots i think it was with with normal pong geometry of a ball bouncing around so I made a cocktail table out of that. As far as I know, I'm not saying this to brag at all. I'm, just, I, I, I'm leading up to a point. Um, I think that I made the first cocktail table because it was a, a carpentry shop right behind where I worked and lived. And I said, hey, look, I'm, I'm going to take this game. Put, let's put it in a table like this, which we did. I took the whole game apart, put the mount, mount of the monitor. And, and there was a signal on the board. Most of these early games have it. That was one player, two player depending on whether it was one player or two player, player one or player two, the signal was either high or low. So that's easy. So I hooked up a little relay, got that signal, used a transistor and a relay, and I made a yoke swapping relay, which I was sure would blow up the monitor. While the monitor was on and live, the relay would reverse the horizontal and the vertical yoke connections so the other player could see the picture right side up. And when it was my turn or the other player's turn, it would flip back again. And I did it as an experiment. And I thought, this monitor, there's no way it's going to last. It couldn't possibly enjoy having the yokes disconnected and reconnected like that. It never failed. It never failed. It lasted for years and years. So my point is, you know, reversing the yoke, which is what we were talking about. That's what that other yoke connector does. It simply reverses the vertical and reverses the horizontal. And that's all I did with the relay. And it worked great. And in fact, subsequently, we had a a universal system at area amusements where I worked, where the games were in a drawer. And to replace a whole game, all we did was pull the drawer out, stick a new drawer in, and that was bubble bobble or, you know, whatever the game was. And, um, And to make it so that it would reverse it, that whole platform, that game, had a yoke reversing relay that you could either engage or disengage depending on what the video was coming out. So uh, I see another question from Brad, uh, AC coupled video versus DC coupled video. And that's an excellent question, I think. Is everybody ready for this? I think, I think that's an excellent question, uh, Brad. Brad, who we have no idea who he is. He's just silent and <laughs> just there without a camera or a microphone. So, so anyway, so here we go. So it's, it's a great question. And, and actually, here is a very... This is also a very cool little trick that you can use uh, for troubleshooting. So uh, stand by. Stand by while I figure out what I'm doing here. Stand by. I'm going to switch cameras. Stand by. Stand by. Mm. There. All right. So this is a very cool trick that you can use, and I used it a lot. Um, And it sort of comes under a heading of figuring out when I have no picture, is my monitor wigging out? You know, what's going on with my monitor here? Is it, does it have good video input or not? So here's the deal. Um, If we look at kind of almost any video circuit for the monitor, here's the way it works. So there's the input connector. There's pin one, two, three, four, five, six. 
And then as you probably know, there's another three pin connector right here. So uh, this is pin one, two, three, four, five, six, and this three pin connector, one, two, three. So as you know, in fact, maybe I'll just use some color pens here just to make it pretty. Hang on. R, G, B. I think I can do this, let's see. So we have three signals that come out of the board, as you know, and one of them is the red video signal, and one of them is the green video signal. That goes to pin two, red is pin one, green is pin two, and the blue signal is, goes into pin three, there's obviously blue. Red, green, and blue, as you know, are the three primary colors of light. By combining red, green, and blue in different combinations, uh, we can make any color that we want. Um, if uh, someone like wants to call up color bars on the internet and show it color bars, that's fine. Or you do your own search for something called color bars, you'll see the primary colors and the secondary colors. So by combining red, green, and blue in different combinations, we can make any color that we want. And remember that all these are, are changing voltages. Um, it's some kind of voltage, typically between uh, zero volts to around five volts. Uh, it may be one volt to four volts. There's not really a standard for it. And the higher the voltage, the more of that color appears on the screen. So for example, when the computer, which is the thing sending out the red, green, and blue signals out of the JAMA connector, right? Um, if it wants something to appear red on the screen, it might put out, you know, maybe plus four volts out the red wire, and that would turn on the red gun, and you'd see red on the screen. If it wanted something to be red but not quite so bright, it might only put out two volts, and it would still be red. It just wouldn't be so bright. So, so the higher the color, the more, the more that, uh, the higher the voltage, the more that color is. Uh, pin four is the ground connection, gund ground. And uh, pins five and six are the positive sync inputs. As you probably know, um, there are two different polarities for sync. And I know we're not really talking about this right now. But um, sync can either be what we call positive sync or negative sync. Well, like in the old days when Williams was making their Defender and Robotron and Joust and stuff like that, they used what we call positive sync. And what positive sync is, if you care, and that's not the, our subject right here, is that when the computer wants to synchronize the monitor, it momentarily jumps the voltage from zero volts up to five volts and then back down again to zero volts. And that makes a pulse like that that's going up in the up direction. That's what we call positive sync. But um, the Japanese games use just the opposite. You know, when games like Galaxian and... Pac-Man and stuff like that started coming in, they used what we refer to as negative sync. And negative sync is just the opposite. In a negative sync system, the voltage on the sync wire is normally up at five volts, what we call a logic high. And to synchronize, it drops the voltage back down or down to zero volts, zero volts, and then back up again to five volts. So it does what's known as a current sink. It sinks the current down. It drops it down to zero, which is actually a, a, technically a somewhat better way to do things. For positive sync, you are doing something known as sourcing. You are sending a positive volt pulse to something. But here, what you're really doing is dragging that down to ground. Zero volts is ground. And it's much easier for a transistor and a circuit to do that, to, to turn on a, sw a switch that, that grounds something. So, so negative sync is actually a better system, kind of. They do both work. And, and so there is a separate sync connector for negative sync. And uh, uh, what, pin one is, is ground, right? And uh, pin two is negative horizontal sync. And pin three is negative vertical sync. So your game will either use one or the other, either positive or negative sync, but we're really talking about the video now. So, so this is the video connector right here. And so let's just go back to just the video. I don't even know why I got started on that. Right. Um, and this goes into some sort of an amplifier. And typically a, a video amplifier is sort of something like this. And I'm really gonna simplify the heck out of this just for the sake of discussion. Typically it's like a transistor 
and the output of this transistor maybe goes to another transistor, or this is an integrated circuit. It could be an integrated circuit. Um, I'm just kind of doing this from memory, just, just to show you some stuff here. Uh, oops, emitter clutch follower, like this. Uh, and then this guy, so it's like some kind of a little video amplifier. So this is called the video amplifier. And it takes this very low level signal coming in and kind of boosts it up. And it shoots it off the main board to the neck board, typically. And on the neck board is where the video output transistors are. And I'm gonna just draw a very simplified version of this. It has a, and these are the big transistors that are on the neck board, the three largest transistors, on, the only three on the neck board typically. Well, not, I shouldn't say that. The largest three transistors on the neck board. And typically that goes up to like the, what's known as the video B plus. The video B plus is a separate power supply typically than the main power supply that powers the rest of the thing. And then this goes to the cathode of the actual picture tube. And if I've gotten a little advanced for you, uh, please go back to some previous workshops where we really discussed how all of this actually works. So, so here's the deal. The question was, sorry if, we, if we're ready here, the difference between DC or AC coupling is what we call, or is it C-O-U-P-L-I-N-G, coupling? I don't know, spell check. All right, so, um, so here's the deal. What I've shown you here is direct coupling. DC coupling. It's directly coupled. Whatever comes out of the monitor, right, uh, out of the computer board, goes right to the base of the transistor. This can be possibly dangerous because if something fails on the board and it puts DC out of the video and like some weird failure, it can wipe out the, the amplifier because the amplifier is DC and it's just going to be turned on full bore and it's going to burn up possibly not necessarily but possibly um so in some cases very often like like the geo7 is like this the electro home geo7 is like this and there's an important reason why i'm mentioning this and you'll see why in just a second on the other hand like the k7000 has a capacitor here on the input i think it's like 10 microfarads or something like that i can't really recall what it is um and as i just said earlier in this in this discussion a capacitor will block direct current, but a capacitor will pass alternating current or any changing voltages right through it. It doesn't necessarily have to go positive, negative, but the, the voltage has to kind of be jumping up and down. So, so this video signal is like that. I mean, it's just kind of moving all around naturally. And so that video signal can get right through the capacitor to the base of the transistor. That, that lead's called the base, and that's the controlling element that turns the thing on. And it, you know, it, it does its thing with, with amplifying the video. So the difference between DC or AC coupling is whether or not it has that little capacitor on there. It's the same exact thing on an oscilloscope. On an oscilloscope, if you care, you may not, um, you can change the coupling from DC to AC. And all it does when you flip it over to AC coupling is put a capacitor in series with the input of the probe and it removes any DC component and just shows you the AC component of whatever it is that you're looking at. So, but here's the trick. If everybody's ready, here's the big trick. You're out in the field. Well, you know, I'm a field service guy. So you're out in the field somewhere and you, you have a monitor and it turns on, you can get raster is the video working? In other words, you got raster, but, and it plays, makes all the game sounds, but there's no actual video signal. Is your video amplifier bad? Well, using some sort of a battery or some source of direct current, I can use, I can put a little bit of DC in there, anything between about zero and five volts, and the higher that voltage is, the more red I'll see on the screen. It won't be synchronized, it'll just be a red screen. And the higher the voltage is, the more red is. So if you, if you insert a little bit of voltage into the red input there and you see red on the screen, you know that the red amplifier is working okay. And of course, it's the same for the, for the green and the blue. Uh, however, if, it, if it's a K7000, let's say, or any AC coupled, AC coupled input, when you touch 
the DC input to the red input, let's say, you will only see a momentary red flash on the screen. Because as soon as that capacitor charges up, which it will in half a second, to the same rate as the DC you're putting in, then there's no more DC coming in and, and, it, and it, the amplifier is off. So, so the difference is, and it's a really cool trick to use, that on a G07 or any direct coupled uh, video amplifier, if I can inject a little bit of DC into the, into the video input, I could see that color, red, green, or blue on the screen. If it's a K7000 or something else that's AC coupled, when I, when I put the DC on there, I will see a momentary flash of red, green, or blue. Now, here's the real cool trick. You should have a meter with a diode test setting. They all have it. You really, you, you, I, I don't think it's possible to even get one without one. So your meter has a diode test setting. Sometimes it's the same as the 2K ohm setting on your meter. Sometimes it's actually a dedicated diode test setting. And you have a black meter lead and you have a red meter lead. And what the diode test setting does is when you put your meter leads across a diode, there's a battery inside your meter and the, the meter sends some juice out the red wire and measures what's coming back on the black wire and shows you the reading, which we refer to, if it's working, as the junction drop. It's called the junction drop. It is not the purpose of this discussion to talk about semiconductors, but it typically it shows you like about seven tenths of a volt or so if it's good and it's like it's shorted if it's bad. Anyway, my point here really is that this is a great source. It's a great source of DC. You don't need to hook up a battery. All you have to do is connect this black. This is the common black meter. You connect that to ground to the chassis and using the red meter, sorry, using the red meter probe, touch the red probe to pins one, two, and three, and observing the screen, power on at the time, and you'll see red, green, and blue flashes on the screen. And that's a super easy test. It really tests everything except the sink. You can test everything except synchronization this way in a monitor, because you just plug it in, you get the raster, you do that touchy thing, and you got the video. And since sync is such a, it actually is a rare failure. Maybe these days it's getting more common, but sync failure, the sync circuit doesn't work very hard. It's not a common failure. And so in general, you can kind of assume that the monitor is good if you got perfectly good raster and you touch your meter leads to prims one, two, and three, and you get the color and there you go. So if that makes sense, awesome. If it doesn't, oh well. That was a really neat tip. Thank you for that. Yeah. Definitely interesting. Yeah, I think it's very interesting. I like it. Okay. Uh, what time is it here? We have like a half hour, yeah? Like an hour 30, I think. Yeah. Or hour 30 into it. Yeah. Uh, cool. Randy, I asked you yeah. last week through the Facebook page about how to test the, uh, I think it's the horizontal output transistor on the G07. You yeah. said if we just check con uh, conductivity from the case of the transistor to ground, if it's continuity shorted, then it, is the continuity is the continuity. Continuity, yeah. Okay, it means the same it, thing, of course. Yeah, if it was shorted, then it's clearly bad. Yeah, or I, or something in that circuit is bad. It it, it could be the transistor itself. Yeah. It's possible, but not likely. Uh, so I immediately grabbed my meter, went off and probed two of these. One of which was on a chassis with no flyback attached. That's one it. on a okay. chassis with flyback attached. And one of them gave me a, a fixed reading, uh, you know, 0 0.6. The other one gave me a reading that was jumping all over the place. And so uh, I was sure. I can you know, nothing foot. should be jumping, certainly. Uh, I, can, I can show a video of the reading if, if that's of use here or not. Sure. I can, I can attempt to anyways. Let me yeah, try. Yeah, let's see. Condition. Hey, 21st century. Let's see how this works. All right. Yeah, let's see. So it's, I think it's, I movie, it's movie time. It's time. I'll cue it up. Wow. Hey, cool, man. That? This is so great. When I hit play, the okay. first reading will be uh, uh, the one with uh, no flyback attached. Then it'll go back to zero. And then you'll see the one which was jumping around. And let me stop you for one second. Your black meter lead is touching the metal chassis of the monitor. And your red meter lead is touching the case of the transistor. Is that right? Correct. OK, let's see the whole thing again. 
So you're on megomes there. 600, 600K is what that is. That, but yeah. it should be infinite. I'm not really sure about that. And the second one, that's... You see, it was just jumping all over the place. Uh, I don't think you have it connected right. That doesn't seem right. I mean, that isn't right. It certainly isn't uh... right. And um, the only reading you might get when you, when you touch the red meter lead to the collector, the metal case, is that you might see the main filter capacitor in the power supply charge up. But right. it isn't really flicking around like that. If you hold your meter steady on it, it yep. it'll eventually go up until it says open on the meter. Now, I think you're using the wrong scale on the meter. Are you using the diode test setting or are you on ohms? Nope, that's my ohm setting. Ohms. Uh, here, I can, yep. I'll bring the image back up. Uh, yeah, um, typically I use, well, I guess it really shouldn't make any difference whether you use ohms, yeah. 41k see that's that's way too low it seems like a lot of ohms but, but that, that be that's infinite. when it's that's when it's jumping all over the place right so do you think it has a bad flyback does this, or, does, this does this flyback look bad this one didn't look bad hmm. the the one where i took the flyback off the it, it was blown there was no ambiguity there uh, okay yeah um i guess in this case um I would uh, remove the transistor from the circuit. Let's check the transistor out of circuit. Okay. And then we'll check the circuit itself by making the exact same test to where the collector used to be, where it was connected, but now the transistor's out of circuit, so it's not Got there it. anymore. And let's see the two readings that we get. Yeah, okay. I have lots of time on this. You know, I'm still <laughs> waiting on side art and things like that. It's always good if you can do test the same thing two ways. In other words, if you can somehow test the thing that, that you think is bad, you took out, but also somehow test where it came from, uh, or, or really any, I guess, logically speaking, any two different ways that you can figure out if something is good or bad. For example, just give you an example of what I'm talking about, because I may be confusing you. Let's say I have a bad thing with an identical good thing, and they're made out of different parts. I can take a piece out of the good thing and try it in the bad thing and see if it fixes it. Or I can take a piece out of the bad thing and try it in the known good working thing and see if that part is bad. And yep. that's what I try to do. Assuming, of course, that I'm not doing anything stupid like putting something dead short into the good thing. In other words, if, I, if I'm doing a swap, it means that I can't figure out if a part is good or bad. So um, I just swap the parts. But I, tr I, try, I try when possible to take the the, the suspected part and put it in a known good working test bed knowing of course that there's a possibility I could screw that up and now I got two bad things and, and that's a possibility and I can't say it hasn't happened to me but hmm. I think I had Andrew uh, nerd nerd store I'm at the nerd herd oh you you are there that's not a fake oh, background it is no it's a fake background it's uh, that's oh, a scene from, from the television show Chuck Oh, oh, I never saw it. If, if you're familiar with it, but you may not be. Are you using so, uh, split, X Split, or what are you using for your camera software? Uh, the camera built into my laptop. Oh. So th this uh, Zoom has the ability to change your background. Virtually. Oh, of course it does. That's right. I, you know, what? as soon as we stop doing this, I don't look at Zoom until the next week. It's you know, although I should Zoom with my mother, really. I, I I use it far too much on a day to day basis, so we start having fun with it. That's all. Ah, good question from Magdalena Marcos. So uh, excellent, sir, and I'm ready to I'm ready to discuss it, and you can listen again and again if you don't fully understand. So so Magdalena's pregunta es su pregunta es his question is. What is the recommended method of adjusting the brightness in combination with uh, the flyback setting, with in combination with the flyback setting? So there's a few ways to do this. And, and I don't have a machine here, obviously, but I, I, I think it's important to cover this. And I think it's a great question and maybe the last question of the, of the session. Uh, stand by. I think I just discussed this with somebody on Facebook. Just, in fact, Logan, didn't you and I discuss this maybe on the phone or something? I think brightness? so. I think you said that I had a brightness problem on, on my, my flyback when you saw the, the photo of the tube on the front. But I think, I really think that all of it was because of C501 because it, it was making everything go haywire. I mean, oh, okay. completely. All right. 
So let me uh, let me get to his question then here. Let's uh, finish polishing this off. Stand by. So I'm going to talk about actually uh, adjusting things in general, not necessarily. I mean, you, didn't you ask about GO7 or something? Let's see. No, you didn't. Okay. So just, yeah, it's a, sort of a general discussion of this. Um, and here's the idea. Let me think about this. Uh, ideally, what we're trying to do is balance out the red, green, and blue so that we have good, what's known as grayscale. When properly adjusted, red, green, and blue are all adjusted perfectly, perfectly properly, what we should see is white on the screen. When everything is just perfect, it should be white. So that's our goal. And our goal is also to use the minimum amount of brightness that we can possibly get that's acceptable. That's always been important, but it's really especially important now because CRT failure is huge and you know, there's no way back. Once the CRT is burned out, you're, you're screwed. So um, I saw this a lot when I was working in the field. Um, I still see it, where games are just adjusted super bright with super high contrast and it's all weird looking. Um, I see this on some of the gaming groups, especially like the CRT group, where you guys, not you guys, uh, people really want to see the scan lines. Man, they, if, you have, if you have 240 lines of resolution, man, you want to see every scan line, and it wants to be crisp, and you want to see what Mario's built out of and, and, and like that. Um, and if it's misadjusted, that, all that goes south. So, so here are like the main controls. And, and he's, he also mentioned the thing on the flyback. So on the flyback transformer, as you know, there are at least two pots, and, and sometimes they're on the flat screen ones, there, there are two focus pots. But the ones that you work on, the top one is focus, and the bottom one is known as screen. It's labeled screen, S-C-R-E-E-N, screen. And what it's referring to is not the picture tube screen. It is not referring to the picture tube screen at all. Not really. It's referring to something as known as the screen grid in the picture tube, which is grid number two or G2. So here's the picture tube, kind of. And, uh, and you know, there are three uh, cathodes, one for red. No, sorry, just draw that. Mm -hmm. uh, one for red, one for green, and one for blue. So these are the cathodes. And the definition of cathode is something that emits electrons. We went over this in a previous discussion, so I'm going to whip through it kind of fast. So the cathodes, which actually electrically, I mean, physically speaking, are cylinders. I'll draw one bigger here. Are cylinders like this. And they're coated on the top with an element known as barium. Again, we went through this before. And when it's heated up with the little filament, the 6.3 volt AC heater that, that goes up inside. It's called the heater. Um, it, this thing emits electrons. The barium boils off all these electrons. Well, we have to get those electrons to shoot toward the front of the screen. The electrons got to whack. They have to whack against the, the glass front of the screen. So in front of this, there is something known as the screen grid. It's called the screen grid. It is G2, grid number two. There's another grid in front of it that you don't care about. Obviously, it's called G1. And it's the control grid. We don't care about that at the moment. So it's the voltage on the screen grid that propels the electrons forward. We have these, again, we went over this. We have negatively charged electrons here. They need to be attracted toward the front of the screen. So there's this thing called the screen grid, which isn't a grid like this. It's called the grid because in the early days of vacuum tubes, that is what the grid was. In this case, it's just a piece, a hollow piece of metal. That, that's all it really is. It's just a hollow piece of metal that the electrons pass through. So this screen grid can be anything from about zero volts to maybe 
plus 300 or 350, kind of depending on where the monitor is. The higher the voltage on the screen grid, which is what you're controlling with that potentiometer, and I'm not sure about this, either the more electrons come out, but I think they come out faster. I think it's not more electrons. I think they just come out faster. That the higher the voltage there is, I'm pretty sure about that. The faster, see how fast they're going. Ooh, they're, they're really hauling butt. It's not speed of light, but it's, it's fast. Um, and then as we discussed before, and we're not gonna discuss it any further, the electrons bounce off the front of the screen and make the light. You know, they hit the front of the screen, make the light and they bounce off and we don't care about the rest of it. So, so what the screen grid is doing, it's adjusting the voltage on that screen grid. And that's why, and that's why, that's why it's called the screen because it's adjusting that voltage there. Right? Uh -huh. So that's one of the, the brightness controls. And, and really, you could call that the main, you could call that the main brightness control in a monitor, couldn't you? Now, in the standard monitor setup procedure, in the books, if you read it, it might say something like, put a meter on G2, set G2 for 175 volts DC, and that would be the proper setting. But typically, we, we don't look at the setup instructions. So what I'm going to give you absolutely may not be the same as the setup instructions in any book. It may not be. I'm just telling you this is an easy thing that worked for me and it's probably okay. So the other controls are that on the neck board of the monitor, typically you have two groups of controls. You have a group of three potentiometers and anytime you see thing in things in threes in a monitor, you're probably looking at RGB, aren't you, right? Because there's the, those three. And so these are known as the cutoffs. These are called the cutoffs. And as the name implies, we are setting where the gun stops emitting electrons. It's called the cutoff, where the gun is cut off, where it's going to stop control, uh, stop emitting electrons. And then typically, there's also a group of two potentiometers that are called the drive controls. They are the drives. And it may be a red and a green drive. It may be a red and a blue drive. It may be a blue and a green drive. The concept behind this is that at the factory somewhere, there is a fixed resistor on there that sets let's say in this case, the blue. The, the blue is preset. And ideally what you're doing in some sort of a technique using a meter or a scope, which I don't know about because they're all different, um, you are setting red and green drive to somehow match that thing. And, and I'm unsure about that procedure because I honestly don't care about it at all. I, I'm getting to what I do in, ju in just a second. So we have a pair of drives here. We have the three cutoffs. And then very often on the chassis itself or on the remote board, you have another potentiometer that's called contrast and another potentiometer that's called brightness. So are we with everybody with me here? So there's a lot of things that we can adjust that make the brightness. Obviously focus is just focus. You look at the screen and focus it. That's no big deal. But we have the screen. We have the contrast and brightness controls, which are low voltage controls that work on the level where the video input comes in. That's where brightness and contrast it comes in. Contrast is the thing controlling the actual video voltage. In other words, you're really how, how hard you're driving the actual video amplifier, the thing I talked about previously. Brightness is brightness. Brightness brings the whole the whole image up. I mean, you know, if you play with Photoshop, you know what brightness and contrast do, right? So the way I do it is this. There's a couple, I'll explain two ways to do it. What I do is this. I turn all the cutoffs to minimum, far counter, counterclockwise, as far anti-clockwise, counterclockwise as you possibly can. I set the red, green, and blue cutoffs to minimum and then I typically center the drive controls. 
I just put the potentiometer, you know, it, it's got a slot on it, right? You know, so I just make the slot go straight up and down. It's, you know, I rotate it back and forth and I make sure that that's power's off right now, typically, not necessarily though. Uh, so, I, so I center the drives. I center all three of the drives. I will typically also center the contrast and center the brightness. So with the cutoff set to minimum and all these guys centered, I turn on the monitor and I slowly bring up the screen until I just barely have raster. You know that just seeing uh, on, the, on the monitor itself, when you see just the square brightness with no picture, that is known as raster. So I don't need any, I don't have any signal hooked up to it at this point, no pattern generator or anything like that. Not really, and I probably don't need it. So I turn that up until I barely see raster and I'm looking now for grayscale. I'm looking for a proper grayscale. Now for me, it's a little tougher because I'm actually colorblind and so, uh, but I can tell white. I mean, I know what white is and I can see if it's slightly pink or slightly green or red. So, so um, I look at the color. Let's just say, for example, that it's a little bit red. Now, remember, all these cutoffs are set to minimum. So let's say I crank it up and it looks a little bit red. What I need to do then is just bring up the green and blue just enough so that red, green, and blue combine together, make white. Again, I'm looking, I'm looking for grayscale. So if it's red on the screen and I start to bring up the green, that will make yellow. Remember, red and green together make yellow. You need to know what the primary and secondary colors are. Um, uh, I'll, it'll be a little yellow. Then I'll bring up a little bit of blue, just barely until it looks perfectly white. And then I've set the cutoffs. If for some reason I just can't bring up the green or blue enough or red, depending on what, what, what ones these are, if I, like I'm, messing with the cutoff and it's just real weak, maybe because the tube is weak or whatever, then if these are adjustable, like if it's, you know, let's say green and blue in this case, uh, then I will adjust the drive to bring that color up. But you have to be careful about adjusting the drive because then it, it overdrives the guns and you end up with this weird fuzzy raster line. It's instead of being nice and crisp, it's overdriven and it's, it's, it's fat, you know, and it's, it's kind of, it looks like it's out of focus. It isn't really. It's just kind of overdriven. Um, um, so that's one way to do it. Um, and then if I want a little more contrast, I'll just adjust that a little, maybe turn down the brightness or turn it up a little bit. But I'd like to leave these guys centered because that gives me play either way. If a pot is centered, I can either turn it up or turn it down. So the only ones that the, the proper set off is, is typically these cutoffs that you set to minimum and bring them up one at a time. The other way to do that is to center the cutoffs. And, and you could do this too. It's perfectly fine. If you center all three of the cutoffs and you look at the grayscale and it looks a little pink, turn the red down. It looks a little too green, turn the green down. If it looks like it's yellow, Maybe turn the blue up or turn the red and green down. In other words, once you know what the primary and secondary colors are, it's, it's pretty easy to set these things up. But it's important to know what those colors are. So, you know, if, for example, let's go back to where I set these things to minimum. Sorry, I should have set this, said this earlier. Where, where these things are all set to minimum, what if you, on the screen, then you cranked it up a little bit and you saw that it's, uh, let's say, uh, cyan kind of a blue green color is known as cyan. It's a mixture of blue and green mixed together. It looks cyan. Well, then all I have to do is bring up the red and that'll make it white, if that makes any sense to you. So, so that's how I kind of do it. Um, I like to keep the screen pot at as low, as low a level as I possibly can, because if I crank up the screen pot too much, it's really going to burn all the phosphors on the front of the screen. So I really like to keep things minimal. And since you're not in a bright arcade, probably you're in your basement or something like that, you can turn off the lights and play. Um, it behooves you to really keep the brightness down, I think. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Um, interesting. Thank you, Randy. Uh, yeah, sure. I learned yeah. um, the translation later to understand it well. Very thank. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Oh. 
How come there's no blue drive um, pot? Well, like I said, there there may be a blue drive, and and what they do. Let me just change cameras here. Hang on. Stand by. It's hard for me to multitask. Well, at least for the sake of my Geo Seven, I have no blue drive pot. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, what they do is they set one in your case blue with a fixed resistor. And if you look at the Geo Seven manual, I'm sure it tells you to make this voltage adjustment and bring up the green and red to match the blue. But you know what? You just have to eyeball the thing as far as I'm concerned. Just start with everything low and bring it up a little bit at a time. Now, for many of you, one of the problems is going to be that your, your guns are actually bad. That, that is to say, the CRT is bad and you have weak red or weak green or weak blue. And, um, and you can test that easily enough just by grounding the cathode. I think we talked about this before. Did we not, John or somebody? Uh, all you need is yeah, a piece of did. wire. And you, and you look at some other workshop. And you just ground one into the chassis. And if you momentarily touch the cathodes, which are labeled on the neck board, R, K, uh, R, R, B, and G, uh, you should get a super bright red, green, or blue on the screen. And if it's grounded oh. and you see hardly any color, you've proven you have proven that the CRT is bad. And that doesn't mean you have to throw it away. It doesn't mean you can't kind of fix it, but rejuvenate. You can rejuvenate it possibly. And I, I posted, I think I posted on the Facebook page an article on how you can increase the heater voltage and bring up the whole monitor's brightness quite a bit, really. Uh, mm. I think I have that on there. Interesting. I think I think I tried doing the, the tuning adjustment by turning all you know all the cutoffs all the way down centering the drives but i think because of c501 it didn't matter because i was turning them down and nothing happened at all they weren't they weren't dimming so i think because of that part i couldn't even do the the setup adjustment alone well, Logan, it, you know it's a uh, welcome to the club and it's a great feeling to fix something i gotta say i mean i still i've mentioned this before when i fix something i do this little dance in my underpants kind of a thing <laughs> i'm really happy when i fix something i i I don't know. It's just really rewarding to me to fix something. I'm not creative in any way, but I can fix stuff. I have to be careful. My kids won't let me watch this video anymore. <laughs> all right. Well, I think we've had a great session. Thank you very much for all your swell questions. I really, Magdalena, uh, mucho gusto, senor. And, and, and so happy to, to have you here. And all to all my Canadian countrymen, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate that a lot. Abdul, you're there. Hello, Abdul. You're there. I see you kind of, sort of, in the dark. <laughs> Hi, Abdul. He's laying down. He's having a nap. All right. Oh, thank you, Renee. Oh, I appreciate that, Andrew. That's very nice. All right. So let's call it quits. And uh, thank you very much for everything. And um, hopefully there's going to be a recording. It says it's recording. So I'll, uh, I'll download it and upload it to my YouTube channel. And thanks a lot for coming. Thanks, Randy. That was awesome. Thank you, Randy. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thanks. That was great. I appreciate it very much. Thanks. Take care. Take care. Bye. No, I don't care. Hmm.